Okay, let's start, guys, and let everybody else meander in um, as they come in. Let's take a moment to think about the poor kids at Parkland School yesterday, the ones who died and the ones who sustained terrible trauma. Let's take a moment of silence. Thank you. Today, um, we have uh, as our speaker somebody who literally needs no introduction because he's been at the University of Louisville since 19, well, let's just say for a number of years. Uh, Dr. Ramirez um, is well known to this audience. Um, he is the uh, chief of the Division of Infectious Disease, the HIV program, the Bone and Joint Infection Program, and the Global Health and Ref Refugee Health uh, Programs here. Um, he actually trained in Argentina and Chile before coming to the States where he redid his internal medicine residency and then did his infectious disease fellowship here at the University of Louisville before uh, joining the faculty. Um, he has been a real asset to our Department of Medicine and to the School of Medicine for the uh, many initiatives um, that he has taken. I think many of us in this room have taken advantage um, of the huge clinical trials and clinical research infrastructure um, that he has developed um, over the years. He's given us many lectures about his favorite topic, which I think is community-acquired pneumonia, um, and also given us lectures about uh, how to develop a clinical research program. And that today is going to be the topic of his lecture. Julio? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, then, uh, essentially, I'm going to give you an, an overview of clinical research, uh, what we call from idea to publication. And, and this is the outline of, the, of my presentation. <clears throat> I'm going to address a little bit first of the uh, definitions and study the science, going to planning, analyzing the study, disseminating study findings, and then, as was already alluded, a little bit of our clinical research infrastructure that we have in the Division of Infectious Disease. Um, regarding the uh, definition of, of research, then we are going to, in biomedical research, we generate new knowledge doing research, and the, and the ultimate goal for us is always to improve patient care. Then we can say that, that this creation of new knowledge to improve patient care, while we are doing you no know, evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice, with the idea to do patient care using the best uh, research uh, evidence. Uh, I was just walking through what, uh, to what the the, the, the ground rounds, and I notice all these figures that creating knowledge to improve patient care that we have around the, the hospital. This is what we do at the university. We create new knowledge with the idea to improve patient care. Uh, and, and the evidence, as you know, in the, in the literature, there are different ways to, uh, to look at the evidence, but mostly you see this pyramid of evidence uh, with a, what we have considered high-quality evidence uh, the, the prospective, randomized, double-blind clinical trial, and then moving, and this will be all the, the research, for instance, laboratory research, moving to animal research, going into research using human subjects that would be defined as clinical research. Um, and what I'm discussing uh, today, uh, clinical research, we have either interventional studies or we have the possibility of observational studies. Then interventional studies are usually higher in the pyramid of evidence. Uh, then essentially when we go now to make rounds and see patients and try to do the best for the patient, we're always looking at this. We're looking what is the best evidence in, in research. And there are different ways to, to, to evaluate the, the evidence. Now we have the GRACE system, probably the most uh, accepted. But going back to, to research, then I mentioned that Clinical research is the generation of new knowledge when we are doing studies with patients. And then what are the, the clinical studies uh, or the designs of the clinical studies? Then the, the interventional studies, 
as you know, intervention is with the investigator is going to do something to a patient. It's going to be an intervention. Then we're going to give a drug, we're going to give a questionnaire, we're going to do something to the patient, and then we're going to have the classical one, the randomized uh, clinical trial. Then we have non-randomized non clinical trial, what is also quasi-experimental study, but sometimes the pre-post-intervention uh, studies. All these are going to be intervention studies. Then we have the, the observation studies from the single, single uh, case report, case series, all the way to the cohort uh, study. I'm going to go to the, to the different uh, designs, but we know that the cohort study is the one that you select a large group of patients that you follow the patients uh, over time. As always, these, um, these observational studies, for instance, may be retrospective, may be prospective. And I want to uh, emphasize here that when we do patient care and we look at the best evidence, even though the best evidence is coming for prospective randomized double-blind clinical trials, most of what we do with our patients is based on observational studies. Because 70 to 80 percent of what we know in medicine is based on observational studies. Um, and I have, to, for instance, I was yesterday I opened the annals of internal medicine that I arrived home and I, because I was giving this presentation, say, let me go through the annals and figure out what type of designs do we have there. There was not a single interventional studies. They were all observational studies and meta-analysis and systematic review. Then, I, then I want to, uh, even though the best evidence is clinical trials, prospective clinical trials, this is 30% of research, of clinical research. Most of the clinical research is observational studies. Um, and for anyone that is going to start doing clinical research, at the beginning will always be observational studies. Now, this is the, the best evidence, but the problem is these are the most expensive studies, and these are, you need to have very well funded, and this is why these are more difficult to, to do. Most of the things that you are going to be reading are going to be coming from cohort studies. Okay, um, if I want to simplify everything that happened in clinical research just in four steps, it doesn't matter if it's going to be a clinical trial or it's going to be a cohort study, four steps, all clinical research. And this will be the four steps. We always start with planning the study, then we move to performing the study, then we move to analyzing the data, and then we're going to disseminate the results. Because really the, the definition of clinical research is the creation and dissemination of new knowledge using subjects. Then we need to create new knowledge, the first three steps. We need to disseminate the knowledge, the last step. Then uh, in planning the study, uh, you go from idea, this is the research question, this is, these are the, the subtopics. You end up with a, with a study uh, protocol. Uh, if I want to say performing the study, you do patient enrollment, you do data collection, you end it with your study uh, database. Analyzing the data, you look at the statistical analysis, clinical analysis, you end it with your conclusion of your study. And then when you try to disseminate, there are different ways to disseminate research. You can write abstract posters that you end it, but you're going to end it with a the, with the peer review uh, publication. Um, then this will be the, the five-minute summary of clinical research. Now, uh, let me go for a little more detail just to, to get another 40 minutes of the presentation. Then, um, then uh, the planning and performing of the study, going with a little more uh, detail. <clears throat> in, in, when we look at clinical research, you need to look at the patients in the universe, when you read it, the patients in the universe is all the patients globally that you want to improve practice. This is the difference between clinical practice and clinical research. When we go on now main rounds, we improve the care of one patient at a time. When we're doing clinical research and we have a question, it's for the questions of the patients in the universe. Then if you are dealing with diabetes or pneumonia or renal disease, you are interested in a question that applies to everybody with renal disease all over the world. These are the patients in the universe. Uh, you notice that there is a lack of knowledge by reading the literature, by going to meetings, and you come out with your research question. I always mention in clinical research, 
Coming with a research question is not a problem. You go make rounds today, you're going to come up with 20 important questions. Then what is the problem? The problem is what is going to be the question that based on what I have available, I'm going to be able to answer. Then the challenge is you need to match a very, the, the most important questions that you can get with the possibilities that you have to answer the question. Um, <clears throat> then we come up with a research uh, question, uh, and after the research question, then is the time to write this one or two pages study outline, or the letter of intent, or these are different names, but you were to go all the way to the to an NIH proposal, maybe your, your aims, uh, but it's always one page to two pages that you have to tell the story. And this is going to be essentially these one or two pages as you have this idea, and then what you're going to write in these two pages. It's, it's almost like a, it's a mini protocol. Now in these two pages, you're going to say what is your rationale? I mean, you've been reading the literature, why is the study necessary? What is the objective of the study? Or what is the question that you're going to uh, address? <coughs> The study may or may not have a hypothesis. I will discuss it. The study is an observational study. We spent two years collecting every pneumonia patient in Louisville to define the incidence of pneumonia per 100,000 population to estimate the incidence of pneumonia in the United States. There is no hypothesis. We are just counting the number of pneumonia patients every day in Louisville. Now, you're going to have a predictor variable, the outcome variable. You think that this is associated with that then you're going to have a hypothesis. But then you're going to see what subjects, who are the subjects, how many, the variables, the predictor variable, the outcome variable, and then the statistical issues. This one or two pages is something that you're going to start moving around with your colleagues, with your other investigators, and they're going to tell you, yes, do this, change. And you're still in the, in the you're not even doing the study. You're still trying to figure out if this study is valid. This idea that I have this great question, do you think that it's a valid question? It's how you're going to, you need to put things into one or two pages, and then people are going to let you know if this is uh, good to continue or not. Let's say that everybody said this is a great idea, these two pages look great, let's move ahead, let's do this. Um, then we're going to start writing the study documents. We're still in the planning of the study. And the study documents, I always say that we need to address uh, four questions. Uh, what do you plan to do? And what you plan to do is essentially the study protocol. Step by step, everything that you're going to do in your uh, clinical uh, study. Um, how you're going to do it is the study manual, the standard operating procedures. I mean, one thing is the protocol. I want to enroll patients with fevers. The other thing is how you're going to measure the fever, what thermometer you're going to use, the, 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 the procedures of how you're going to do the study. How much is going to cost? Every study has a cost. It's interesting because we discuss this study is funded. This study is unfunded. Well, from the outside. But every study has a cost. Even when a resident is doing the case report, I mean, someone is putting time, someone is putting energy, there's always a cost. The question is who is going to pay? Now, sometimes when we pay, because we do the unfunded studies, we call this study is unfunded, but someone is always paying. Um, then you have to have a study budget. Uh, and another thing that, that, that everything that we're going to do in research, we need to know if we are going to be able to do it. This is, you need to ask permission to do any form of research. Then you need to have ethical and regulatory documents. I remember, you know, some of us remember the, the years that a case report was just a case report. Let me write the case report, let me send it. Because a case report was just a case report. A case report is research. A case report is one piece of the observational studies. A case report, you need to go to the IRB, you need to have permission. Because everything that you do in research, someone will have to give you permission. Um, besides these study documents, there are the two important elements, that is the data collection form and the database that you're going to use for your study. And we always discuss, the, 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 when you start developing the data collection form, you are start already developing the, the database, because the data collection form needs to match the database. Uh, and, and at this moment, probably, uh, a red cap, this uh, database developed by Vanderbilt University for a grant from the NIH, is becoming the, 
the standard database that in all universities, at the moment there are more than, than 300 universities using REDCap, and probably this is going to be, and I understand even in some requests for application from the NIH, now they are requesting that you're going to use REDCap as your database. Then uh, we are moving to every one of our red databases now is, is REDCap. This is going to be the, probably the standard moving forward. Uh, all this is in the planning of the study. A lot of work to do in the planning of the study. Um, then we finish with the, with the planning. Everything is approved. Your protocol is approved. You have your database. And now we are going to be uh, moving to performing the, the study. And performing the study, simplistically, we can say, well, we're going to, if it's a prospective uh, study, we're going to find the patients, enroll the patients. We may or may not need to get uh, consent following uh, uh, patients. You do the data entry. Uh, and, and then everything is going into the database. In this process of doing the study, there's a, there's a critical aspect that is the aspect of data quality to be sure that your data is solid. And then after some period of time, we are going to say, okay, we have enough of quality, uh, and we are going to log the database, and you're going to, we are going to finish this idea of performing the, the study. Um, I have to tell you that, that okay, then, then essentially, once you log the database, you already have the three type of patients that we always discuss in clinical research. Um, as you mentioned, we deal with, with pneumonia. And if we want to see if this antibiotic is going to decrease mortality or pneumonia, we want to see if this antibiotic decrease mortality in the patients in the universe. We want to say if this antibiotic decrease mortality, we want these antibiotics to be used in every country, all over the world, in every patient with pneumonia. Now, then we study the patients in the universe with a sample that are the 500 patients that I, got, I have in my study protocol. At the end of the day, the only patient that I have are the ones that are in the study database. That is 0, 500 is always going to be less. Let's say it's 300. Then we have three types of patients. The patients in the universe, the patients that I wanted to study in the protocol, that is simple because I write the protocol having coffee, and then the patient in the database that is performing the study, going to the hospital, doing this, and then I always lost patients. This is the patients in the study database. Um, then I finish. Uh, planning and performing the, the study. Until now, until we finish with the, with the locking the database, uh, this is a prospective cohort study that you want to do of the next 300 patients with diabetes that you want to see in the clinic. And you have your question, uh, and you plan the study. You have everything approved for the IRB. Uh, everything is in order. You perform the study. You lock the study database. Um, of course, every study is different, but it's going to be very unlikely that this is going to be less than one year. This is going to be between one or two years for every study. Um, then this is why sometimes it's interesting to me when, when uh, a fellow that's going to be two years, a fellowship in some place, or, or even a resident, is going to say, oh, just take six months, one year, to figure out what idea do you have. Then you're going to write the protocol. Then you're going to collect the patient. And I was thinking, by the time that you finish with the database, you are gone. You're already in a different university. Unless you want to do residence here, fellowship here, and then remain here as a faculty. Um, this is a long time. Uh, now, uh, what are the alternatives that we have? Well, if we were to know that at this moment, someone in in GI is doing a prospective study, enrolling patients with liver disease, and you know that this is going on already, and they are collecting patients. Well, one possibility is to do an ancillary study. I know the data collection form. I know the database. I approach the group that is doing this. I say, well, you know what? I would like to ask this different question to your study. And then you add a new question. We are doing a pneumonia study, and we are collecting all the patients. And someone said, well, you know, I'm interested to see this, all these problems with influenza. I'm interested to see how well the influenza vaccine worked this year. Can we ask a question, do you receive influenza vaccine? Well, we're already spending the money and the effort. Then you just blend with an ancillary study. Then this would be one way to, for, for, for a for a person to do speed and economy. Even 
more uh, economy and even better is if you arrive to a place and you say, well, these are the different databases that we have in this university. This is a database of patients with cardiological problems, that this is the issue. This is a database from patients with pneumonia. This is the data. And then you know the databases, and you learn about the database. This is what they collected. And essentially, you come out with a research question to the database. This is what's called secondary data analysis. Then, and I may say, this is what I say, this is what a resident is supposed to be doing, or even a fellow. The data is already collected, the data quality is already there, the database was already done. This, and I have to tell you that anyone that has a database with thousands of patients, ever recognize that there is not enough time to publish. There's not enough time to get all the publications from a large database. There's always something new, to, there's always a new question to the database. Then uh, this will be secondary data analysis. We publish a lot in the division of secondary data analysis of all the databases that we have. Uh, then yesterday I was estimating that um, in 2017, from all the members of the division, we have close to 57 publications. Now, these 57 publications, because we perform 57 prospects, no. There were five, six, seven publications of the original publication, and the rest is these large databases that we keep asking questions. Um, okay, then uh, you have your question, you have your data, either because you went through the full painful two years to collect all the data, or you just went to someone that had the data. The data is there. Now, this is your question. Now you're going to do the, the analysis or the study results based on your question. Um, we may, then we are here in the analysis. Then you have the study database, you have the study result. And these antibiotics decrease mortality. Or this, or as we look the other day, someone said, well, uh, we have all these question, uh, all this um, controversy of obesity and infection. Because it seems to be that obesity is a protected factor for infection. Then we're looking at is our obese patients just better outcomes in, with pneumonia. This is in the database. We are just, it's a secondary data analysis. Then we, let's say that we find obese patients just decrease mortality. Um, we need to come up with these study results. And again, I'm not interested to see if the obese patients in Louisville have decreased mortality. I want to say that every obese patient in the universe is going to have decreased mortality if they have pneumonia. Because this is the goal. You're doing research for the patients in the universe. Um, then you have to infer from your results to what happened in the universe. Then, from the patients in the universe, we get the sample, we get the database, we get an answer. Uh, now, as always, uh, the answer that I got from, let's say, from Louisville, uh, obesity is associated with decreased mortality. Well, I get an answer. I, this, the database always gives you an answer. Uh, now, the answer may be the right answer or the wrong answer. No, this is, now we're starting the analysis. This is always the case. Um, is the association cause-effect? Is obesity is associated with decreased mortality. Well, uh, if this is the case, I got the right answer. I get the truth in the universe. Uh, the other option is that obesity associated with decreased mortality is the wrong answer. And maybe the wrong answer because of confounder, bias, or chance. And this is why we start, when you start doing the data analysis, it's always the same process, the same type of question. Uh, if this is the truth, then the predictor variable is causing the outcome variable, the truth in, the, in your data. Maybe confounding, because the association, that the problem with confounding, that is, again, this is so confusing, <laughs> confounding, because the association that you find is real. The predictor variable is always associated with the outcome variable, but the association is not cause-effect. Everybody that opened it, a book of research is always the same example. Not predictor variable, coffee, outcome variable, lung cancer, confounded variable, smoking. Because really, the person that drink too much coffee always smoke, and then the smoking is the cause of lung cancer. 
Well, but the question is, then, is coffee associated with lung cancer? The answer is yes. You can repeat the study in every place, and the people that drink a lot of coffee are going to have lung cancer. This is the problem of confounder. It looks very real because you keep doing, keep doing, and you keep finding the same result. But the problem is that coffee is associated with lung cancer, but it's not the cause of lung cancer. Then in confounder, the association is real. The problem is not cause-effect. Then you have bias, where the association is false, and then chance, where the association is false. So again, you have to all, uh, and I have to say that we don't need to know heavy statistics to do clinical research, but we need to know statistics to discuss with a statistician. And more important, in the same way that we need the statisticians to be in our midst to see how do we think as clinicians, as clinicians, we need to know how statisticians think. Because this is a totally different universe. They are living in a different universe. Okay? And you cannot collaborate if one person is in one universe and the other is in a different one. Um, and then, to throw another thing into the mix, they would say, well, I'm confused. I mean, this is what obesity has to do with mortality. Let me get some help. And the statistician is going to throw you a p-value. Okay? They are going to get all this data, they are going to throw you a p-value. Uh, and and for us, uh, we women don't know anything about the p-value, but we want a value that is very low. We want a 0, 0.000. The more zeros, the better. We, we all agree with this. Then, um, I don't want to ask this question, but mentally, I ask you for you to answer mentally. Um, you get the p-value. Then what is the meaning of a low p-value? The p-value is 0.0001. Because you get your study result. Uh, and you don't know if the study result is right or wrong, because we discuss. Then uh, a low p-value, you may answer in your mind uh, that the answer to a low p-value is A, because this, the probability of increased truth in the data. Maybe B, because there's a probability of less bias. Maybe C, because the probability of less confounding. D, probability of less chance. Or E, there is a significant probability that all of these things are happening with my data when I get a low p-value. Now, when I do this in our clinical research course that we do every year, or when we do a clinical research course in other areas, when I get medical students and residents, I still have to see a group that get more than 50% the correct answer. Always more than 50% is the incorrect answer. That, that this is a problem for us, for our core educators, because um, uh, then the, uh, the answer, the only answer is chance. No, then the, a low p-value indicates that the possibility of chance in my results are decreased. Um, now, I'm, I'm always concerned with the, with the answer A or the answer E, because E includes A. And, and then uh, I'm always concerned with someone that is, quote, unquote, in the scientific arena, assuming that in science we know the truth, and sh assuming that if with some form of mathematical modeling we are going to get close to the truth. Um, when this is, this is, what is truth is something that you're not going to get in this uh, presentation, nor in anything doing clinical research, because truth is an elusive concept um, in science. Now, the point is in a statistic, Statistical tests cannot be used to conclude that a hypothesis is probably true. A statistical tests can be used essentially to conclude that a hypothesis is probably false. Now you may say, well, if this is false, the other is true. No. You talk to a statistician, they never talk truth because they are scientists. The only, uh, again, truth is out of the picture. And the only thing that they are going to tell you is that something is most likely false. Okay, then... I have my question. Uh, does this antibiotic decrease mortality? <clears throat> I have my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that, well, I, I read the literature, I went to, my hypothesis is this new antibiotic is going to decrease mortality in pneumonia. This is my hypothesis. This is what I want to prove. <clears throat> but then, statistics can only prove that a hypothesis is false. And then you read a little more, and you have this question of the rejection rule. 
then the only thing is that, again, a hypothesis can never be accepted. A hypothesis can only be rejected. Then what do we do? Because I don't want to give my hypothesis to my statistician to be rejected. Then we come up with this confusing concept that, well, we need to come up with a new hypothesis to give to the statistician, someone that these guys can play around and can reject. But I don't want to give my hypothesis to them because I don't want my hypothesis to be rejected. Um, then we come up with the alternative hypothesis, the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis that my antibiotic has nothing to do with mortality. Then this new antibiotic that I evaluated has that, or my question that obesity and mortality has nothing to do. It doesn't matter if you are undernourished, normal weight, uh, overweight, obese, it has nothing to do with the outcome of the patient with pneumonia. Then this will be the null hypothesis. Um, then essentially, now we're going to the null hypothesis is, again, there is no association between whatever is your predictor variable and your outcome variable. Then this is the hypothesis that is rejected by the statistician where they have enough evidence to support that this hypothesis is probably false. And this enough evidence is coming with a p-value is less than 0 0.05. Then if you reject this, then you can consider the alternative hypothesis. Just as a brief review then, then your research hypothesis is the predictor variable, the, um, this antibiotic is going to decrease mortality. The null hypothesis, this new antibiotic has, is not associated with mortality. Is no relationship. The alternative hypothesis is that this antibiotic is associated with mortality. There is a relationship. I don't know if the new antibiotic is going to increase mortality or decrease mortality. I don't know the what direction, but the alternative hypothesis is telling me that there is an association. Then when the null hypothesis is rejected, we move to the alternative hypothesis. Then a small p-value indicates strong evidence against the null hypothesis, so is rejected. Again, now, because this is rejected, doesn't mean that this is true. Think, truth has nothing to do with what we're discussing. The only thing that we know, this is rejected. Uh, another way to look at this, when you read about uh, p-values, is that a p-value of, of 0 0.05 or, or 5%, then you got a 5% risk of a false positive result. When, if there was no, if my antibiotic has nothing to do with mortality, and I reject the null hypothesis, I still have 5% possibility that I'm having the wrong, I have a, the 5% possibility that chance explain the result. Then, um, then still this will be a false positive result, meaning that I consider that my hypothesis uh, was not rejected, is, I want to, is, is valid, but in reality it's a false, you get a false positive result. Um, then this is the critical point after all this. It's a mistake to believe a research hypothesis just because the p-value is statistically significant. And you can have a very, very significant p-value. And you may say, well, this result, the possibility of chance is low. What about confounding? What about bias? You may have a low p-value and the results can be completely wrong. Because the study is completely biased or you have a lot of confounders in the study. And this is just one piece, I may say a little piece of the equation. Um, but at the end, we need to infer what happened with the conclusions into the universe. And then um, we are going to come up with our conclusions that we're going to say this study suggests, this study indicates, this study uh, we consider. But we will never say the truth is that this happened because we don't know what's the truth. Um, then in this predictor variable, outcome variable, uh, the we are questioning the association is cause, effect, and then what are the techniques during this assessment period of your data? You are reviewing your study, you are reviewing your study results, you are looking at your, at your data. Um, then of course, it's not just the p-value, there's a lot of other statistical analysis that you're going to work with the statistician. Uh, or you're going to do yourself to, to evaluate the, the significance. Then there is a p-value, uh, 
common things, no relative risk, the odds ratio, relative risk for, for prospective clinical trials or for uh, cohort studies, um, uh, odds ratio for case control studies. We're going to look at the confidence interval. The, the multivariate analysis, the, the, there are different techniques for multivariate analysis. This is, we measure confounders when we, in our data collection, and then the statistician is going to look at these confounders to see what is the, how much of this confounder is really alter the association, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening with the microphone, alter the association of the predictor variable with the outcome variable. Um, then, uh, now it's also uh, important that, that, that the multivariate analysis, we can adjust For me to move back? Oh, the volume. Okay. <clears throat> um, then when we say that, well, there's not a problem with confounders because the, the statistician is going to adjust for confounders. Uh, well, the issue is that the statistician can adjust for any confounder that we measure. This is why the data collection form is so critical because uh, someone will need to look at your data collection form to be sure that you don't miss any confounder that you need to measure, because then this is what the statistician is going to be able to adjust. Uh, at the end of the day, we can only adjust for confounders that we know. We cannot adjust for the unknown confounders. And this is why in the pyramid of evidence, the prospective randomized trial is at the top, because randomization adjust for confounders that we know and confounders that we don't know. And of course, the randomization is at the top of the pyramid to, to prevent, to adjust for confounders, but to do this, as we mentioned, is, is a very expensive proposition. Um, and then there is the clinical analysis. Some people stop with the, with the statistical analysis, but, but when you read about this, we know that the clinical analysis is much more important than the statistical analysis. Some people even consider, first do the clinical analysis. If the clinical analysis is not there, why spend the time in statistics? <clears throat> but the clinical analysis, then we look at the, the consistency with looking at other studies. What, what other studies are of this particular predictor variable? The strength of the association is not just that it's significant, but you know, the number needed to treat, the risk ratio. The, the biological plausibility, what is the, the pathophysiology that's going to explain the, how the predictor variable is associated with the outcome variable. But at the end of the day, is the useful, or is, what, is, is the so what? Is the question of the so what of my result? I mean, how are we going to apply this into clinical practice? This is, what, this is the most important evaluation of your data. How is that I can use this to improve patient care. Um, and you have something that is very significant, but has zero application in patient care. I mean, who cares that you have a very low p-value? Now, you have a p-value that is 0 0.06. You say, oh, I didn't reach this 0 0.05, 0 0.06. But the application in patient care will be tremendous. Who cares is 5% or 6%? Who cares if you have 5% of a false positive versus 6% from the clinical point of view? It's because 5%, the statistician said 5% or less is significant, 5% or above is not significant. This means that I'm not going to use something because this is 5% possibility of false positive versus 6%. There's no difference. Then I remember the first studies of, of elevating the head of the bed in the patient in the ICU to prevent ventilator oxygen pneumonia. And people were, remember that everybody was flat in the ICU 20 years ago. Now people said, let's elevate the head of the bed because we may prevent aspiration from the stomach. And the first studies, the P-value were, you know, they were not significant. But people said, well, who cares? I mean, it's just elevating the bed, just in case you may prevent ventilator oxygen pneumonia. Let's do it. And we started doing this even before the P was significant. As they said, you get enough patients and now it became significant, and, and you have one study, two studies, three studies. When is truth for you? How many studies do you need? Five? Four is maybe one, five. 
and you may want 10. She's more skeptical. Then, who, what is truth? I don't know. You just keep, but once you have 20 studies in different places, well, we say, well, you know what? This probably is the case. Because as scientists, the first study, what is your opinion? Oh, these guys don't know what they're doing. Oh, show me the bias. Oh, they confound. This is always the case. Then, um, they, but once you have 20 studies, some people say, well, you know, let's elevate the head of the bed to everybody, and this is now the standard of practice. But at the beginning, the P was not significant. But plenty of people didn't care. Then again, the clinical analysis is very important. Then this, of course, we add the, the statistical analysis, the clinical analysis, and we come up with a conclusion. We come up with a conclusion of our uh, uh, clinical research. Um, <clears throat> then disseminate the study findings. Then we mentioned that we started with the idea, we finished with a publication, we write the study outline, write the, the protocol, we write the manual, the, we perform the study, analyze the data, we write the abstract, the poster, we write the, the article. Then what I try to say is that, that there's a lot of writing in clinical research. Then a lot of people say that, that you cannot do good clinical research unless you master medical writing. You just have to write, write, and write. Then this is critical. We cannot be running around all day long, and every time that we sit in front of the computer, there's something else to do. Or there's a new text message, or there's a new email. This attention deficit disorder is killing clinical research, because it's killing writing. Um, OK. Then another thing is that writing is difficult. If it were simple, everybody would have 20 publications a year. Then you need to have a writing group. Again, this is a support group. I mean, this is, this is an alcoholic. You need, you need a support group. Then you don't know how to write. You need a support group. We need a writing group. And your manuscript, you rewrite, rewrite, rewrite this version one, version two, version seven, version. Uh, and then one day you submit. It is always it's going to be a rejection. Then you have to resubmit to the other journal. So you say, oh, this, all these manuscripts are rejected. Well, I always say that, that once you write a manuscript that have version 20, and you finish, this is your baby, this is your manuscript, and everybody believes that your baby is beautiful. Then this is my baby, it's beautiful. This baby is ready for the New England Journal of Medicine. I would say, no, it's not going to be, no, no, I'm going to, okay, we you send it and, and you reject it, reject it, and then finally your baby is going to be accepted someplace in the middle. Um, okay, then finally you get your publication. Um, then a clinical study is not completed until you get your publication in a peer-reviewed journal. This is why our uh, review course that we do every year is from idea to publication. Because without publication, you didn't finish your study. And this is why the, there are two statements for publication. One, investigators are measured by their publication. And really, uh, you can be in any university all over the universe. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you don't have publications, you're not going to get promoted. Doesn't matter what percentage you're doing or this or that. Publication has to be in your CV. And the other thing that is, is a challenge and I challenge, is that without prior publication, there is no grant. Then, oh, I have this idea. I want to apply for this grant to study this or that. How much work have you done in this topic? How many publications do you have? No, this is my first. You're not going to get a grant. Nobody's going to give money to someone that doesn't have a track or that you've been, done, you've been doing this for some time. It's not going to happen. And this is then, this is the catch 22. If I cannot get funded unless I have at least five to 10 publications in the topic, how are I going to get my first publication? Um, well, this is why you are living in a university setting. Uh, and now we are moving into the, then my last section has to do with the, with the challenges that we have in clinical research. And one of the big challenges, as I just put here, is the, is the clinical research infrastructure. Um, because uh, you look at the literature, it's all over the place. P people keep getting together every couple of months, this society, to go uh, one day, spending day, what do we, how can we improve clinical research in the United States? The answer is always the same, the problems. The problem is that we don't have enough mentors, there is not enough training program, there is not enough funding, and there is not enough infrastructure. And people keep getting together and keep getting also the same uh, problems. Um, <clears throat> now, what are we doing in our universe of infectious diseases? Uh, every member of the division is a mentor for clinical research, for, for studies on uh, clinical research with our um, 
for our trainees or, or people that are with us in the division. Uh, we have um, one training program that is the, essentially what I've done now in these 45 minutes, to these 40 minutes, is going to be the, the outline of our one-day training program. Imagine this expand to eight hours, this hour one-day training program. We used to do a seven-day training program, but it was very difficult to find someone that attended the program. Then we concentrate all this in a, in a Saturday from, from eight to five. Um, and then we have a, a clinical research training program. It's an internship. We went through all the process at the University of Louisville. We get approved at every level to have our clinical research internship that we have some members here that is, is a one-year uh, um, internship with us in the division. Minimal amount of funding. Well, funding, uh, every division is supposed to have funding for research. This is why you do funded studies, you do studies with industry, you do all, and then it's supposed to be some money in your account that this money is going to do, you are going to use to generate new information, then it's going to be, you are going to use your own money. This is why you want to do clinical research, you need to attach to a group that is already doing clinical research, because they are going to be able to give you the support. Uh, and then inadequate infrastructure support. Over the years, um, we've been uh, developing our infrastructure uh, support. Um, when I started here, uh, to talk to an statistician, I needed to go to the School of Public Health. And, and it was very, a, a, a difficult challenge to me. Then finally, uh, over the years, uh, because we have funded, we're able to bring statisticians to the division, and we have data managers. Then we develop a, 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 our infrastructure for research. Uh, and just to finish, then this is a, a, a picture of how our infrastructure looks uh, today. <clears throat> and we have different units. Uh, we have the strategic planning and administrative unit with four uh, members. That are the ones that you are coming with an idea or do, because we have also, we support other members of the, of the department and we've been working probably with every division. You come to us, you are going to probably meet with one of these group from the strategic planning. They coordinate all the other units. For our own research, we have a clinical research operation unit. Uh, and our Louisville clinical site, as we know, are the nine hospitals. We work in the nine hospitals in Louisville plus uh, clinics. Then our pneumonia study, we finish a, a group B a streptococcal a, a study. We are, are starting now with a staph aureus bacteremic study. Everything ap applied to the nine uh, hospitals. Um, we have a regulatory and financial unit um, with Kendra that is to be sure that, that, we are, that everything is in order. Uh, our, from the 150 members of the ID division, we are more or less 50 that are dedicated to, to clinical research. Then when you have 50 uh, members doing clinical research, uh, there's a lot of activities that happen in clinical research. Then, then we need to, to have 50 people that are approved in every hospital, that have approved in the IRB. That there's a lot of, of regulatory financial units. There's a database with uh, Kim that, that she's our expert in REDCAP. Uh, there's a data quality unit with several members that, that as we mentioned, we do uh, quality for all our studies. The statistical analysis unit, some of you may have worked before uh, with Tim uh, Winkham, that was our statistician for several years. Now, Stephen is our uh, lead statistician, and we, as he has several other members on the statistical team. A, a laboratory unit with uh, Leslie Wolf, uh, and uh, Leslie is one of the faculty members uh, that, that, again, you may have remembered the name of, of Jim Summerskill, that was the director of our laboratory. Now, uh, Dr. Wolf is the new director of our reference laboratory, but at the same time, is the director of the laboratory unit that we do a lot of laboratory research, but it's laboratory research applied to the things that we're doing in clinical research. Um, for instance, they're just looking at a, they develop a, a PCR to look at the urine to define a, a gene for a streptococcal pneumonia. Then they develop the PCR because we are interested in pneumonia. We know that the urine is a simple sample. We are looking at urine samples. Then it's laboratory research applied to our clinical research. Uh, research informatic, uh, Bill uh, Mattingly, that, again, coming from the, the School of uh, Engineering, uh, and he's very much into, into uh, informatics. That is a lot of things that I presented in, in our research uh, studies that were developed with this unit. The information technology unit, uh, Chris, because when you, uh, from the 100 pe 150 members of the ID division, probably 100 or more were in the Med Center one. Then we are, 
We're in the neighborhood, but we are far away. It's almost three, four blocks from here. And when we have 50 people doing clinical research connected to every hospital, uh, making sure that everything works, whenever we have a problem with a computer, we cannot put a ticket to the university and figure out in four or five days when we are going to reconnect to Baptist Hospital. This needs to happen now. Then we have our own information technology in Med Center One to be sure that computer issues get resolved uh, right there. Uh, we have a biorepository unit, uh, and Subit is, uh, again, a biorepository unit. Uh, we don't have a biorepository as our colleagues from cancer have. That is a massive biorepository. But we have you no know, more than 10,000 samples in our uh, biorepository. And uh, with all the implications, we are working with different universities. We submit samples. You need to have a database to manage your, your biorepository. And, and finally, um, Emily, that is in charge of our personal management unit, uh, that, that, that again, to maintain everything in order and salaries and uh, overtime, but also uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, foreign medical graduates and we work a lot with the international unit to have all these visas in order to be sure that, that everything is in the, in the proper order. Then this is more or less the, the idea of our clinical research coordinator center that support uh, the research in the division and, and again, for the last years probably support plenty of your clinical studies for several of the members of the, of the department. And essentially, um, I discussed a little bit of the, of the definition. I want to emphasize to the, to the students, to the residents, that this is why you need universities. This is why you need all forms of research, from laboratory research to animal research to clinical research, because this is where the new knowledge is generated. If the medical students, five years down the road or 10 years down the road, are going to if they are going to learn something different, it's because you guys doing research in a university setting generated the new knowledge that's going to advance patient care. Without clinical research, there is not advancement. There is no new knowledge. Then this is a critical part. Now, another thing is that you go now, see your patient with pneumonia, and you treat the patient, you are doing patient care of one patient. You do a study of pneumonia, and you come up with a new intervention for pneumonia, and you are treating every pneumonia patient all over the universe. Then we are doing research to generate new methods to improve patient care. This is why it's so critical. And why the university? Because you know, you need a village. You need a village to do, it, to do everything that we do, but you need, a, you need a, definitely a team to do clinical research. It's impossible to do it uh, alone. Uh, then you, I went through planning, performing the study, analyzing the study results, disseminating the study finding, the, the research finished when you, because if we do all our study and we found that this intervention worked and I don't publish, it's not research because I'm doing research for the patients in the universe. If this intervention, no, I need to publish for the guy in China, in Chile, in South Africa, be able to use it. Otherwise, I'm not doing research for my patients. I do research for the patients in the universe. Without publication, there is no research. How the other people are going to know? And finally, uh, our efforts to put together a clinical research infrastructure that again is, is available to anyone in the, in the Department of Medicine that wants to get uh, involved in some clinical research activity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julio. I have one little comment. Okay, I am a basic science researcher, and I saw that basic science research falls under the low quality research. I would prefer to think of that as maybe preclinical, you know, not, not, not low quality, because I hope everything I've done has been low quality. Um, but uh, let me ask you. No, 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 let, let, me, let me clarify. It doesn't say low quality, it says low evidence. Uh, because, you know, and it's not me, it's the people that are evidence-based medicine. The evidence-based medicine, then what is the, what the research that you're doing, how much of this research you can apply to patient care, and what is the evidence? Now, it's interesting. We do a lot of things in patients based on laboratory research. I can tell you that, that, that we're just discussing this. There are patients with multi-resistant organisms 
that they are resistant to everything. We go to microbiology and say, let's test this new thing against this bacteria. In the tube, seems to be that something happened. We go from laboratory research all the way to the patient. This is very low evidence, extremely low evidence. This can change, but I don't have a clinical, I don't have a case report, I don't have cohort, I don't have clinical trials. Then, but what we need to understand that the evidence that I'm using from the laboratory is still low evidence. It can change as it moves through the process. Yeah, the, the, um, I may say that, that there is, when you say point of care um, research, doing research as we, because they are, this is a, this is a small characteristic of, of the definition of research, uh, cohort studies, and uh, this, this point of care, this something is called now a pragmatic uh, research. There is the idea of doing research with everyday patients, doing research as happened in real life. This is one of the big, negatives of clinical trials. Because people, it's another thing. Why, why most of what we do is coming from cohort studies? A clinical trial, the prospective randomized clinical trial, every time that you look at a clinical trial, you figure out how many exclusion criteria the clinical trial have. And this study, because, <coughs> again, I want to just criticize clinical trials to, to prove the point. Uh, um, because because uh, we are testing a new antibiotic. You're testing a new, any new intervention. The idea of the clinical trial is to get this intervention approved by the regulatory agency. It's a new antibiotic for pneumonia. Okay, it's a new vaccine to prevent pneumonia. Then, and I need to approve this vaccine. Then what do you do? I want to get a study of the vaccine for patients with pneumonia. Okay, this patient has cancer. No, I don't want a cancer patient because I don't know, the immune response may not respond. This patient has said, no, I don't want it. Let me get the perfect patient to test this drug to see if the perfect patient improve. Nothing wrong, but, but this, is, this is the clinical trial. I have this new antibiotic. Oh, the patient is in intensive care unit. No, it's excluded. Intensive care unit is too severe for a new antibiotic. I want the patient on the ward. And then the antibiotic get approved. But, they, but clinical trials never approve things for real life patients. Clinical trials are always the ideal patient. This is the problem of clinical trials. This is why then you need to go back. This is the idea of, what, then they, I'm testing this, this new antibiotic. What is the efficacy? Efficacy is, does the drug work in the ideal situation? Effectiveness, does the drug work in real life? And for real life, go back to, we need to do real life studies. We need to go back to studies with real patients. This is the problem of clinical trials. This is why there is so much of what we do in practice is based on observational studies, because these are real life studies. Yes, thank you. Yes, this is this is one of the primary goals. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Fabulous.